Chapter 11 of The House on the Downs by Gladys Etson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the East Wing. If Mark had found sleep difficult the night before, he found it doubly so now. Surmises and suspicions revolved in his tired brain. What was the cause for Cynthia Melsom's interest in Irene, and to whom had she telephoned in the green room at the Theatre Royal? Somehow Cynthia knew a good deal more than she should of Irene's affairs. The lady's maid, too, had been on the stage years ago, and it was not unlikely she had known both Craddock Rayner and Irene. She might have been telephoning to some acquaintance in the company, the same person perhaps who had told her of Mark's visit to Irene's dressing room. Perhaps they were planning, for reasons best known to themselves, a sort of frame-up against Irene. He thoroughly distrusted Cynthia. The threatened storm was racking the grange now, wind sweeping from the downs, driving rain, sudden searching flashes of lightning, crashes of thunder. Sir Quentin must have returned from the village by now, it was close on to midnight. But had Rodney Sherrod, foolish, half-crazed gypsy, petulant as an undisciplined child, found shelter yet? He had gone bareheaded without any protection against the storm. Mark decided to get up and see if a quiet smoke would induce sleep. He hunted around for his pipe, but could not find it. He remembered taking it out of his pocket just before he fell asleep in the chaise longue. He must have left it on the terrace. He put on dressing gown and stockings and, carrying his boots in his hand, went along the hall to the circular stairs that led down to the dining room. Between the peals of thunder he fancied he heard stirrings through the house, but could not be sure that they were not occasioned by the lashing wind and rain. He had no candle or lamp, and were it not for the frequent flares of lightning, he could not have found his way to the dining room and thence through the lower halls to the music room, for he had no idea where the electric switches were located. Mark thought once of the housekeeper's tale of inexplicable happenings at night in the Grange. He must contrive somehow to bring up the subject with Sir Quentin, and also of that shadowy figure which Cynthia Melsom claimed she had seen stealing up into the disused east wing. He almost wished he might encounter some tangible person to whom he could give a lively few minutes. It would, at least, serve to divert his mind for a short while from worrying over Irene and the mess she had gotten into. But he met no one and discovered nothing out of the usual, unless it were Rodney Sherrod's broken violin, which a flash of lightning revealed on the music stand. As Mark, after putting on his boots, unlocked the French windows and stepped out on the wet terrace, a blue flare rimming the black, far-reaching slopes of the downs, and followed immediately by a crash of thunder that shook the grange, made him fear for a moment that the old Jacobean dwelling had been struck. He looked up at the long, dark outlines and the shuttered windows of the east wing, which ran at right angles to the terrace and was exposed to the full fury of the storm. The lightning had passed beyond, but Mark saw something up there in the closed wing, which was startling under the circumstances. Through the cracks of a loosened shutter, intermittent gleams of light showed forth, as though someone were moving about with a lamp or electric torch. Mark did not stop to hunt for his pipe. The evil genius of the Grange might be up in the east wing now. Hastily locking the French doors after him, he hurried across the music room and so along the hall into the dining room. As he mounted the circular stairs, he had the odd impression that there was someone on the spiral above him going stealthily up, someone whom he could not see, but only hear faintly. Yet when he reached the top of the flight and there were no more stairs above, he fancied he could still detect the sound of cautious footsteps mounting upward. His nerves, of course, were playing him a trick. There was nothing above him but the ceiling of the corridor in which his own room was situated. Moreover, the stairs to the east wing were at the farther end of the corridor, and the door leading up to them was closed. The mounting, ghostly footsteps were directly over his head. No wonder Mrs. Carswell complained of queer doings at the Grange. Mark went quickly toward the door to the east wing. As he turned the handle, which yielded readily enough as on the night before, a woman's voice, high-pitched, vibrating with terror, shrieked loudly once, somewhere in the darkness above. Mark, not knowing what to expect, ran up the stairs, two at a time. In the musty blackness of the corridor, he collided violently with someone who rushed out from the first room leading off it. "'What the devil?' cried a man's voice, choked with fury. An opportune flare of lightning played upon the grimly set countenance of Alwyn Rotherdean. Mark's thoughts raced madly. "'Alwyn!' 
he panted. That scream! For God's sakes, what is going on here? The scream came, I think, said Rotherdean brusquely, from the room at the end of the hall. Snapping on an electric torch, he strode down the long, gloomy corridor to the last room. The door was shut, and Rotherdean struck it open with his foot. The rays from the torch showed the same large, wainscoted apartment into which they had come the night before, crowded with antique furniture, trunks, and packing boxes, and topped by the huge, ornate fireplace. Across the dingy tiles of the wide hearth lay a woman in a huddled, inert heap. The light from the torch glinted on golden hair and the sheen of a costly negligee. Eve! Alwyn cried sharply. At that moment, Mark fancied that he heard again vague footsteps on unseen stairs. Rotherdean knelt down by his young sister-in-law and, raising the lax golden head, supported it against his knee. She has only fainted, he pronounced, his voice gruff with a depth of feeling that rather surprised Mark. Call Mrs. Carswell, will you? Or if she is afraid to come up here, get Facenta Lee. She is the only dependable woman in the house. But other members of the household, aroused by Eve's scream, were gathering excitedly in the hall below, in various stages of undress. Sir Quentin was the first to come up to the east wing. As he bent over Eve, white and limp in Alan's supporting arms, his features contracted. He could not speak for emotion. No need to get in a funk about it, Quentin, the younger Rotherdean admonished. Something terrified her, and she fainted. She'll be right as rain in a few minutes. She's coming to already. Eve's heavily fringed eyelids quivered open. She stared about her dazedly and wildly. Sir Quentin took her in his arms and held her close to his heart. What has happened, Eve, my darling? She clung to him like a terrified child. Somebody or something jumped out at me from the shadows by the fireplace. Quentin, I can't stay in this hateful house. I am beginning to believe there is some malignant power trying to harm me. There is the picture and the bronze bust that almost fell on me. And now this. The baronet pressed his lips to her shining hair. Eve, my dear, he said tenderly, we'll go for a long, delightful trip on the continent next week, just as soon as this bothersome inquest we're subpoenaed for is over. But I am sure we shall find that the picture and the bust fell by accident, and that it was your own imagination that frightened you tonight. And no wonder, with such a storm. But, Eve, how did you happen to come up here? You appeared to be sleeping very peacefully. When I looked in on you a half an hour ago, I was so fearful of waking you that I did not turn on my light. I thought it might shine through the sitting-room and disturb you. And then, after all my pains, in a tone of mock sternness, I find you've given me the slip and come up to this desolate wing. Why did you do it, little girl? Eve stirred restlessly in his embrace. I couldn't sleep on account of the storm, so I got up to write a letter to Florrie Granger, but I couldn't remember her address. I thought it was in a book in my cabin trunk over there, and I simply came up to get it. "'Couldn't the address have waited until morning?' Sir Quentin asked gravely. Eve freed herself petulantly. "'I suppose I had a right to come up here, if I chose.' "'Of course you did, my dear,' the baronet answered gently. "'But I want you to promise me that you will not do so again at night. Not that I believe there is anybody or anything in the whole Grange that would harm you, but I don't like the notion of your wandering around here at night. Nothing would induce me to come up here again,' she shuddered. The other members of the household were hurrying up the stairs now. "'God bless and save us! What's all this?' quavered the excited voice of Mr. Elphick. "'Quentin, you here? You're not hurt in any way!' Alwyn Rotherdean suddenly turned on the switch which lighted the room, and the little naturalist's faded eyes blinked affrightedly upon Sir Quentin. "'You're quite all right, Quentin,' he persisted, ignoring Eve, who, standing now, leaned white and trembling against her husband." Mr. Elphick, in flowered dressing gown and Turkish slippers, presented a somewhat grotesque appearance that at any other time would have appealed to Mark's sense of humor. His plentiful gray hair, always hitherto parted in the middle with meticulous care, was tousled and fairly standing on end. His gold-rimmed spectacles bestrode his nose at an undignified slant, and his round, usually rosy face showed flabby and ashen of hue. The little man was plainly terrified out of his wits. The younger Rotherdean viewed him with uncompromising contempt, but Sir Quentin smiled kindly and reassuringly at his elderly kinsman. Nothing to get fussed over, Cousin Theophilus. Eve found she couldn't sleep and came up here for an address book that was in one of the trunks. The storm excited her nerves, and she imagined someone jumped out at her from the shadows. She screamed and fainted, and that's all there is to it. Dear, dear, exclaimed Mr. Elphick testily, and quite enough, I should think. Her scream gave me a dreadful start. I don't expect to sleep a wink the rest of the night. She shouldn't go roaming about. 
not nice to give us such a fright and not safe sir quentin far from it sir declared the quavering voice of mrs carswell the housekeeper her frail little form enveloped in a voluminous and sombre wrapper stood hesitating in the doorway we all know there's queer doings here at night something very wrong sir quentin the baronet shook his head in reproof certain happenings may appear queer mrs carswell but we must not let our imaginations run away with us i prefer to believe that whatever has occurred is the result of accident or is the figment of hysteria but i do feel that matters have reached a point where we should all enjoy more peace of mind if formal investigation was made and it will be made very shortly too there came an unwonted sternness into his voice shall you call the police sir queried mrs carswell timidly i believe the murder in the hollow is all of a piece with what's happening here eve's frayed nerves snapped at this do allow us to forget craddock rayner for a minute sir quentin gathered his young wife in his arms as though she were a child i'm going to carry you off to bed little girl you're all done in mrs carswell i'd like you to telephone dr petherton cynthia to the lady's maid whose tall well-shaped figure in silk negligee was conspicuous among the group of servants who had come up into the wing go down and make everything comfortable for her ladyship eve voiced a sharp protest i shall not require melsom cynthia shrugged as your ladyship pleases a hint of insolence in her tone you can go to bed then cynthia said sir quentin gravely i dare say her ladyship will be able to sleep now he led the way downstairs carrying eve very tenderly fazenta lee with troubled eyes followed her erstwhile guardian i should be very glad to sit up with lady eve she suggested dr petherton may have some instructions i don't need any one fazenta said eve not too graciously sir quentin turned to the romany with his kindly smile it's good of you to offer fazenta but you see with a touch of whimsicality eve won't have any one but her husband look after her to-night i'm dash proud of being thought so well of fazenta stood at the foot of the stairs and watched sir quentin carrying his cherished burden as though she were a feather's weight fazenta was all gypsy now in a gay red kimono with her great mass of blue-black hair flowing in glossy tresses to her knees her dark eyes lustrous and mystical her skin showing a golden sunburnt tint in the electric light there was passion and tragedy in her mobile face and mark turned away that he might not read there any secret she would wish to keep guarded the servants whispering excitedly went off to their own quarters bless me fazenta exclaimed mr elphick fussily rubbing his hands together are you never going back to bed the storm is dying down now perhaps we can sleep a bit after all the romany shook herself free of whatever thoughts held her perhaps we can mr elphick she agreed tonelessly and went away down the hall mr elphick's room was at the extreme end of the corridor his door leading off the main hall to which this side corridor debouched and so he padded after fazenta his slippers a size too big plopping as he walked mark held the door of the east wing for alwyn rotherdine and cynthia melsom who were the last to descend in the stress of events mark had not noticed before that alwyn was fully dressed even to collar and tie as a matter of fact he was still wearing his dinner clothes his black trousers however were no longer immaculate but dusty and wrinkled his hands too were begrimed mark recollected then that rotherdine had been up in the east wing when eve had screamed he had come out from the first room off the corridor it was probably the rays of his torch gleaming through the cracks of that loosened shutter which he had seen from the terrace what in the world had alwyn been doing up there cynthia melsom's eyes mocking and insolent were taking in every detail of alwyn's appearance the east wing is hard on clothes mr rotherdine she remarked with sly significance alwyn's features were rigid under the black curve of his brow a word of warning he said curtly don't let your interest in the east wing take you up there at night you might share craddock rayner's fate End of chapter eleven